Luke chapter 4. Uh, this is the passage where Jesus Christ has begun his ministry. And the first stages of his ministry as he enters a region in Capernaum after being rejected by his homeland. It started out with a demonic attack. He had a demonic encounter. That's the beginning of his ministry. Look at Luke chapter 4. We'll look at verse 31. And came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, <clears throat> for his word was with power. In the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of Israel. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. It was at Capernaum when he started his ministry that he had an encounter with the devil. He was a certain person. His name is not given. But he was being oppressed. He was being possessed. He was being, he was being uh, hurt under a uh, demonic spirit. His demonic spirit had a hold of this poor man's life for a long time. And when he uh, approached Jesus Christ, he said, leave us alone. What have we to do with you? Jesus Christ, I thank God, he did not leave that devil alone. As a matter of fact, he ruined that devil's business. Yeah. The Lord Jesus Christ rebuked that devil and cast that devil out of that poor man's life. And praise the Lord, that man has finally been freed. Freed from the oppression of those wicked spirits. Free, able to have his own mind. Free to be able to make his own decisions and hopefully make the right decisions where the devil won't take advantage of him anymore. Freed from such brutality, tyranny, and oppression. Oh, what freedom this poor man found because Jesus Christ did not leave that devil alone. Isn't it interesting that during the New Testament you get a lot of cases of demon possession, but not in the Old Testament? Isn't it interesting as soon as Jesus Christ arrived on this earth that there were so many cases of demon possession? You know what I think? I think during that time, during the 400 years of silence, which is between the Old Testament and the New Testament, when the Old Testament ended, Satan had a full advantage was thriving to take over everything in the world and ruining people's lives. I think that's why demon possession cases were high that time, where the devil was thriving and just possessing so many of God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, during that time. Because those people did nothing about it. These people had no spirituality. These people were in complete silence and darkness until Jesus came to the scene. And Jesus brought the light, whereas men brought in darkness. Had not Jesus Christ came in, that poor man would have been left alone. As a matter of fact, those devils, if they were to tell all those people, hey, leave us alone, that's exactly what those people did. Those people left that poor man alone to be oppressed and possessed with devils. And that man was under such tyranny, such brutality and hurt for God knows how many years, because those people did listen to the devil, leave us alone. You know why we're in an age of apostasy? Why we're in an age of darkness? Why Satan is possessing so many people's lives and ruining them? I mean, you look around you, it's like a case of demon possession everywhere and people who are so blinded, people who are in the darkness, and people who are hurting out there, but not a single Christian church is doing anything about it. Because the devil said, hey, leave it alone. And those Christians listened to those demonic spirits and left them alone. Every time they could have witnessed to a soul and led that person to Christ, 
they left it alone every time that sin had to be addressed in the church or in society they left it alone because they didn't want controversy every time things were going on in their own home that they had to set in order they left it alone every time that Christians fellow brethren have been falling apart and they got to help them get up they left those brethren alone every time they see their brother and sister in Christ who is suffering an attack from a devil they left it alone because they were too busy with their own selves we're living in a day and age where we just are doing nothing we leave everything alone there are people who keep repeating a sin problem who can't get victory in their lives because the devil says it's not a big deal leave it alone there are certain deficits with your personality that are actually sinful but the devil said not a big deal they should understand you more leave it alone there there are things that we should not leave alone because they have been left alone it has amped up to full swing demon possession and demonic activity going on throughout our cities you wonder why we're all suffering and reaping the consequences of sins and that we're not seeing God moving in because we're leaving things alone and letting the devil do what he wants. It's high time that Christians get up and stand up for Jesus Christ and not leave something alone. Not leave some things alone. T try to take action. It's about time that you get your eyes open and start to see things out there that the devil has gotten a hold of and not leave it alone. The title of my message is that basically Satan says, leave it alone. Let's pray. Father, will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood? Again, I am nothing without you. Uh, I'm just going to preach however way you lead me to preach. And then may, it, uh, have, may your Holy Spirit work. May lives be changed. And may we be able to do things that will please you. Stir our hearts, Lord. Make this preach and full of the spirit in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. I want to cover verse uh, 31 let's start off with verse 31 <clears throat> and came down to Capernaum a city of Galilee and taught them on the Sabbath days and they were astonished at his doctrine for his word was with power Jesus Christ he went down to Capernaum to preach and to teach Notice he did not go down there to cast out devils. He did not go down there with the intention to cast out devils. He went down there to just simply preach and teach the word of God. As a matter of fact, I think this is pretty much a dumb move. In verse 34, the devil said, let us alone, right? He wants Jesus to leave him alone. Well, then in verse 31 to 32, Jesus, I mean, all he was doing was preaching and teaching, wasn't he? He wasn't going around saying, hey, give me the biggest devil that I could find and cast it out. No, he was simply teaching and preaching the word of God. Amen. This devil was so weird. In verse 33, the devil ran to meet Jesus. If he wanted to be left alone, why would he meet Jesus? That's a really dumb thing to do. Yeah. And what I would do if I was the devil and I wanted to be left alone, run away. Yeah, I would run away. But this devil ran to meet Jesus and demanded leave us alone isn't that weird isn't that weird it's like the same thing here you are street preaching on the corner and then some demon possessed you know liberal you know who's got 20 colors of the rainbow running in his or her or its body runs to you and meets you and you 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 weren't dealing with that person you had nothing to do with that person but that person you know just saw you miles away from the vehicle just drove up to meet you in the car and then parked right there and screamed at you leave us alone you know what that is a thousand devils in that stinking little rainbow unicorn there right that's a thousand devils running in his or her mind or its mind and then just come out leave us alone that's what it is now why would the devil do something like that it's a weird demonic thing right it's a weird demonic thing because that devil knows when Jesus Christ is preaching and teaching the Word of God yeah. his intention is not just hey I'm just gonna preach and that's it when he's doing the work of God he has a goal and a purpose in mind I am 
coming down here to ruin the devil system. Because the devil had a hold, remember, of that area for a long time. During the 400 years of silence, as soon as the Old Testament ended, you get high-rise cases of demon possession, and the devil has a good system going until here comes the Messiah, until here comes God, and then he just preaches the word of God, shatters the darkness with his light. The devil wasn't going to sit down and be quiet. He knows that Jesus came to preach and teach the word of God to mess with my system, to attack me. That's what the devil knew. Jesus definitely had that in mind because notice the context. Jesus said his purpose was actually to deliver demon-possessed people. Look at the context right here. If we look at Luke chapter 4 and then verse 18, Luke 4, 18, the Bible says, and Jesus describes his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath, anointed, he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has set me to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. And recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. See that? Jesus Christ, when he came down to preach the word of God, it was including that intention to give freedom to those who are oppressed, who are enslaved by the devil. Come on, the devil knew that, and that's why he said, leave us alone. You know, when the devil screams at you, leave us alone, you sure do a good job in leaving them alone. But pastor, I go to church. Pastor, I read the Bible. Pastor, I pray. I do go still winning. I do pass out tracts. I try to witness. I preach and I teach the word of God. Well, that's good, but did you always think about this? Did you have it in mind when you're doing these things that I came here to ruin the devil's system? Or are you just reading the Bible just because you're supposed to? Okay. Praying just because you're supposed to? Coming to church just because you're supposed to? You have to realize this. When we came here, it's true we get it for our spiritual benefit, but we forget the goal that's very inclusive. We came here to ruin that evil one's system. Amen. Now why we meet for fellowship? Sure, to encourage each other, but that encouragement is to stir up our soldier spirits Amen. to fight against the devil's system. Amen. But too many Christians and, God forbid, Bible believers are so lost in their blessed assurance that they're enjoying their good time, their own Bible-believing life. They've got their job, they've got their blessings, and they can count their many blessings. they got their brethren, they got a pastor, they got good teaching and preaching. And here they are, lost in church, while the world is thriving in wickedness and souls are dying and burning in hell. Now, we have to keep in mind the reason why we're doing this is to put a dent in the devil's system. And now my question to you is, how hard of a dent have you put on his system? Come on, preacher. Have you hardly put a dent? Wow. Maybe the, your Bible reading and prayer life should change. Maybe your church attendance should change. Maybe the way you preach and teach the word of God should change. Because Jesus Christ right here at Luke chapter 4, verse 31 to 32, if he was just simply preaching and teaching, that demon-possessed person would not have approached him. That demon-possessed person approached him because he knew Jesus came to preach deliverance to the captive, to set at liberty them that are bruised. When he was preaching and teaching the word of God, the intention was to deliver people from the devil's system. Why would he have that in his mind? Because that verse says, liberty to them that are what? Bruised. Bruised. Do you, get, do you forget the purpose of Bible reading and prayer to begin with? Because there are bruised lives. And we need refreshment, healing. We need the power of the Spirit to help us. Because we lived in a bruised world. Do you forget the purpose of Fellowship, it's not for yourself. It's for those other people who are bruised. How many young people have we ignored? How many certain people, brothers and sisters in Christ and church, have we ignored who are bruised? Bruised. How many souls in your home, in your family, 
out there in the world that are bruised and hurting. No, you don't see that. That's the problem. You don't see the bruises. It's about time you open your eyes and see those bruises. That's the reason why you're not putting a dent in the devil's system. That's why your Bible reading, your prayer life, your service for Jesus Christ is not putting a dent in the devil's system. If you are going to put a dent in the devil's system, it's because those wicked devils out there are bruising so many people's lives and souls and their minds and their hearts. And you could care less about it because you're not seeing their bruises. You're too lost in your comfortable life. I, I, I promise you this, when, you're, when you keep watching TV, your nice home, your own stuff in life, you don't see the plenty of bruises that people are going through out there. You're too blind to that. And that's why you're living your daily Christian life just because. Just because you're supposed to. But you're not doing it to put a dent in the devil's system. And that's the reason why people leave our church. That's why people don't get saved. That's why your prayers are not getting answered. And that's the reason why your preaching and teaching of the Word of God is having no effect on people's lives. You know why? You're not seeing the people's bruises. You're more, you're more thinking about how can I preach really great? How can I uh, uh, teach spectacular? You know, how can I get a name for myself? You know, I just want to be the person who reads the most chapters of the Bible. I want to be known as a prayer warrior. I want to attend church because I want something for me, for me, for me. And that's why we leave the church complaining about, I didn't get what I want from that church. You know what your problem is? You're not looking at other people's bruises. And you have to look at their bruises. You know what God needs to do? God needs to get this outward facade out of all of us and then... Have us see the bruised eyes, yeah. the bruised arms, yeah. the bruised faces of the people sitting next to you. And then your heart can work up some compassion and maybe talk to that brother or sister in Christ. Maybe finally pray for them. Maybe have a burden to, once you walk out the doors, see bruised souls. Bruised souls. And then you start to grab them and try to bring them to church. Try to give them a track, at least. Try to lead them to Christ. Go back to your home at your loved ones who you easily get upset with, who you're under tension and dissension, and see their bruises. And then finally you can start to reconcile and heal their bruises rather than thinking about yourself every stinking time. We're not looking at bruises of these people out there. It's good preaching, brother. You know what the ministry is about? It's not about you, it's about others. Right. You know why I entered this Amen. pulpit? Not for myself, it's for others. We forget what the purpose of the ministry is. is for bruise. Bruises. You want to put a dent in the devil's system? You want to help out people? No, you leave them alone. You leave them alone. The devil says, leave it alone. What do they do for you? Leave it alone. You're too busy with your own thing. Leave it alone. Don't you have your own bruises to take care of? Leave it alone because that's supposed to be the pastor's job or so-and-so's job. Leave it alone because, because what? You sure follow the devil's advice when he says to leave it alone. You know why? You don't see the bruise. If you see how bad that bruise is upon that person's life, you would not sit still. If you see the bruise of that sin or that thing in your life that has gotten a stronghold over you, you would not sit still. But we left things in our life unclean, untaken care of. There are things that we have not surrendered yet to the will of God because we have not seen the bruise, the bruise of those things. No, we just too lost in our comfort, our prosperity. The devil covered up the bruises really, really well. Abused victims, they can cover up their bruises really, really well as long as they put on enough makeup for it and still look beautiful. And that's what the devil did. He put a makeup over your sin, wow. over your problems, over those things that you have not surrendered to the Lord, over those other people's lives and souls you should be taking care of, and made it look beautiful. Made it look like there's no serious issue that you have to do yourself. Do you see the bruise 
you know, it's easy for me to preach and to cover my bruises, to be filled with the Spirit, and to look professional and to look right as a leader, as a pastor. But a lot of times you got to look behind this outward thing and see the bruises within. Look at the people sitting next to you, and they are dressed in their Sunday best. But do you see the bruises inside? See, we're too lost in that. We don't see bruises. You need to see the bruises. Then you'll put a dent in the devil's system. Look at verse 32. Uh, verse 33, excuse me, 33. In the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. So it just so happened in the synagogue, there's a man, he's not named, who's possessed with the devil. You know, don't you find it interesting? You look at demon-possessed people throughout the Bible, they're not really named. You notice that? Uh, look at the book of Acts. There was a guy who tore up the seven Jewish boys when they tried to cast out a devil out of him. He mentioned the name of Jesus and Paul, but... A demon-possessed person's name is not given. You look at uh, even the man at Gadarenes, when he was possessed by the devil, legion of devil, his name was not given. The devil's name was given, though, legion. But his name was not given. Well, Pastor Mary Magdalene, her name's mentioned. She was possessed with seven devils. Yeah, but this is after she was free. This was when she found Christ, not during her demon possession. As a matter of fact, she's so unnamed that it never mentioned it at all, the story about Jesus delivering her from seven devils. Never mentioned that story or the specifics of how it happened. Her name or any mentions of her was not given at all. The only mention it gave about her was when she was serving Jesus Christ and then gave, and then gave a brief history. She was possessed by seven devils. This was after this was after demon possession, not during or before. How about that? When you look at demon-possessed people in the Bible, it's strange that uh, even in Acts chapter 16, here's a woman say, you know, who was possessed by a, a spirit of divination following Paul and Silas, and then her name is not given one time. Her name was not given one time. Why is it that isn't it strange that demon-possessed people, during their demonic encounters, their names are not given or mentioned? I wonder why. It's because it's that bleak. It's that unimportant. It's not really well known that the devil always possesses and longs and aims for. You know why the devil does that? Because you don't pay attention. If there's something you don't pay attention to, the devil says, exactly, I want that one. Yes. And he'll possess that thing in your life. You know why there are some things that we wonder in our lives why we can't vi have victory against? Why we can't change? Some sins that we can't just overcome? The reason why is because there were certain things in your life you lived for so many years that you did not pay attention to. Because you didn't think it was a serious problem. You didn't think the devil would possess that or use that against you. But now you're reaping and sowing after 20 years of that, 30 years of that, 50 years of that. And the devil has a stronghold on your life now. Why? Because they were unimportant to you at the beginning. Sure, important now, right? It's taking away your blessed assurance. It's taking away your joy in the Lord. It's affecting your next generation's people around you. Unimportant things the devil always aims for. Oh, wow. Always, all the time, all the time. You know, uh, if you're not going to pay attention to those unimportant places, the devil will. Yes. Those unimportant brothers and sisters in Christ, the devil will. Those unimportant souls out there, the devil will. You know what's sadder than that? Your own family, your own home. It's now be, certain people have become unimportant to you when they should be the most important people in the world and now the devil got them too. Wow. 
You know, the, uh, the devil always aim at the, most, at the most obscure, abstract places where you least expect it. Do you know how globalists have thrived today, become powerful today? They always aim at places where people least expect it. They always like to keep things hidden that people don't know about. That's how the devil gets victory. So it's about time that we stop paying attention to our jobs, our schools, our busyness, our TV, and then the latest episodes to catch up and who's going to win the next football game, the next player who's going to make it to the top. And it's about time that we start paying attention to those places that are unimportant to you and realize they soon will play a very important thing in your life if you don't start paying attention now and taking action now. Unimportant, the devil always goes for. The ones that are not known. It's easy to think about the pastor, right? He's known. He's on the pulpit. You see him. It's easy to miss out some 10-year-old in the church and not see what he or she is going through. Easy to miss out a teenager because not that really important to you. Easy to miss out a brother and sister because haven't been there for a while and it's easy to miss out. Easy to miss out a visitor. Easy to miss out the person you're sitting next to. And that's what the devil wants. He says, okay, there's something he or she's not paying attention to. I'll get that one. Yes, yes. Time to open your eyes and start paying attention. Pastor, there is one person who's demon-possessed and who's named, actually. You missed out. Oh, who is it? Judas Iscariot. You forgot him. You know what? You're right. You're right. Judas Iscariot, he was demon-possessed, and he was named... But can I tell you something? Judas Iscariot is probably one of those few exceptions. But even he was not known to be demon-possessed by the disciples until after he betrayed Christ and died. Then the gospel writers knew he was demon-possessed. But the Bible says that when Judas Iscariot was with them in church helping them, always there with them, three and a half years, they had no idea. They didn't know the devil got a hold of Judas. They couldn't see it. They were too blind to see it. You know what the point is? The devil will get known people, known people in unknown areas in their life where others could have addressed, could have saved them from, but they didn't see it. Here's the pastor. He's known. Everybody pays attention. But there are unknown places, see? Unknown places. People he have to deal with. The days that he has to go through. The kind of demonic attacks he gets. He's not going to publicize those things all the time. And the devil is getting a hold of that pastor. And then all of a sudden, here comes a Sunday where you expect the pastor to be at his best shape and preach and teach the Word of God, and he says, hey, um, I'm going to actually retire. I don't think I'm called to preach. And then it turns like a shockwave to you, right? And you're going to go, why? What happened? Because there were places you didn't know all that time. What's my point? You think you know your brother and sister in Christ. You think you know the pastor. You think you know your spouse. You think you know your children, but there are unknown places you have no idea and you've ignored. You have not addressed. You have not taken care of. And then the devil got a hold of them. You know why? The devil said, leave it alone. Too lost in Laodicean lifestyle that we're not paying attention to those hidden places. Devil says, leave it alone. We are all doing a good job. We just leave things alone. Because we're doing verse 31, 32, just reading our Bibles, praying, just serving Jesus Christ, coming to church without seeing those bruises. 
in verse uh, 34, 34, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. You know why we would listen to that devil when the devil says, leave us alone? Notice that verse says, what have we to do with thee? Exactly. What have you to do with this man, Jesus? Nothing. He, he's not named. You don't know him. Well, you know, God knows everybody, right, by name? So let's forget that part. But you know what I mean, right? He's not familiar with that person. He didn't have a given history of relationship or familiarity with that person. So what business did Jesus have to do to cast out that devil from that man? He had nothing to do with it. Jesus Christ did not leave that poor man alone. He says, no, I'm going to butt into the devil's business. Get out of that man. And that man was free. Amen. But the devil, every time he whispers in your ear, as you see a soul pass by you, as you see a brother and sister in need, as you see a bruise, from one of your close ones within your life, the devil says, leave it alone. And then you leave it alone. Not a big deal. Let it go. You know, you got your Bible reading and prayer to do, don't you think so? You know, you got your own life to do, to take care of, don't you think so? You're serving God and leave it alone and then you just listen. Why? Because it has nothing to do with you. But I promise you this, if it had everything to do with you, if it had to do with you losing your job, you losing your money, yeah. you where you would lose your health, or maybe if you're in danger of losing your life, if it had to do business like that, you'd do anything to get involved in that. You put your utmost attention to that. If your life was being threatened, you stop everything that you do, no matter how busy or how tired or how preoccupied you are or how fleshly or sinful you are everybody would stop what they're doing if their life was at stake and do something about it yeah. but see it has nothing to do with you so that's it's not threatening like that it's not uh it's not a great risk like that that's why you leave it alone you leave it alone uh, i want you to go to luke 10 luke chapter 10 How many times have you listened to the devil every day? Every day. When there's a soul passing by, the devil said, leave it alone. When there's a brother and sister in Christ who's in need, and then the devil said, leave it alone. How many times have you listened? How many times when there's something you should get involved in the church to help out with something, and the devil said, leave it alone, and you listen? How many times have you left holes in your life that need to be patched, that need to be solved and taken care of. But the devil said, leave it alone, and you listened. How many times? Why? Because we don't think that it has anything to do with us. Let me show you something right here in Luke chapter 10, and then verse 30, verse 30. And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Do you see that? This man's name is not given. Did you notice that? He's not known. So he won't have any business related to the following people. Verse 30, And fell among thieves, which stripped him of the raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Oh, this guy is bruised. You talk about bruised. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. So notice right here, the priest passed by this bruised individual. A Levite passed by the bruised individual. Why? It had nothing to do with them. You know, when the devil said, leave it alone, they left it alone. Why? Because it's a certain man. It's not someone important to them. No connection to them. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan. This is a person who's not one of them. Wow. Not one of God's people. He's uh, a half Jew, half Gentile, mixed, corrupted. It's a corrupted individual, basically. Corrupted bloodline. 
as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Notice right here that this Samaritan was the one who took care of the Jew. Now, can I tell you something important, all right? Jesus never mentioned that this Samaritan was a saved individual. He never mentioned about this Samaritan being a saved individual. He just simply instructed a saved Jew or individual to follow what this Samaritan was doing. That's all he did. Now, could it... Could he have been saved? Could Jesus had it in his mind that the Samaritan was a saved person? Sure, maybe, but maybe not as well. The point is he never mentioned that Samaritan to be a saved individual. He just simply mentioned that a person who's not one of God's people wow. showed compassion, whereas God's people didn't. Right there. Right there. You know what the thing is? I know it's none of your business, and you listen to the devil, but the world makes it their business and they will show compassion to that bruised soul where you will fail to do. And that liberal propaganda has already brainwashed so many of your younger generations now where they think that their professors really show compassion on them. That the news media really looks out and cares for them. That the government said they truly want to help out them and give them more of a handout. That their friends in college that their worldly lost damned friends who are putting an evil influence on them, that they care more about them and those people in that hateful Bible-believing church there. You know what the world is? They are doing a good job showing compassion, ministering to the needs of those people. And it's, it's in a bad way, though. It's in a bad way. You are people saying, I want more money, and then government gives them a handout. Here is the people saying, I want something to give me happiness. They provide bars, they provide television, they provide drinks and drugs, whatever can fill in the void. Yes. People are saying, I want to uh, know more truth and knowledge, and then the college professors cram down junk on their throat, whereas Bible believers are just dumb and they don't study anything nowadays because they're lost in their love for Jesus. You know what the world does? They are trying to minister the needs, if not the consumer desires, of the people who are bruised. Because Christians are not ministering to those needs. Remember this. Every soul you ignored, every brother and sister in Christ who did leave this church, the world is right now ministering to their needs. Whether it be sin, whether it be the world, whether it be the devil, but right now they are ministering to their needs. Yes. When a person walks out of here bruised, they want healing from somebody or something, and it will be a bottle if they have to. Right. Okay. Or have you know what they're doing? A bunch of Samaritans. Corrupted things out there that are trying to bind the wounds, show compassion and mercy, because Bible believers have left it alone. You know what the, the Bible says the priest and the Levite did? They saw the bruise. But they made a conscious decision to pass by. The world, on the other hand, they rushed to meet that person's bruise and need. We're too slow as Bible believers. You have to admit that. We're too slow. There's too many people dying and going to hell, too many people hurting, and we are not fast enough. We can't keep it up well enough to minister ever, every need out there. You know why? Because we're too lost at serving Jesus Christ and doing our own thing. Preach and teach in the word of God. All of that to begin with is to help those that are bruised. Do you understand? If I thought that just preach and teach in the word of God was it, why would I pastor here? I would pastor in the South, you know that? I pastor, help out my dad's ministry, you know that? Why would I choose here? Bruise. Yeah, right. yeah. Only reason why I stay here is bruise. Thank you. 
I don't do it just because I preach and teach the Word of God. Do you understand? I'm not trying to uh, talk about myself in a good way and get compliment, but what I want to point out is if you see how important that is for me to be here, yeah. do you realize how many thousands more out there are bruised and hurting, not just you? This is way too small. Do you understand? Yeah. This is not enough. The world is still doing a better job than me. Wow. That's good. Go to Luke. Uh, four. Luke 4. No, our tithing is not good enough. No, our prayers are not good enough. No, our uh, involvement in the ministry is not good enough. No, our soul winning Bible reading is not good enough. We left things alone. Notice right here, uh, the next part, saying, let, uh, verse 34, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know, who, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Okay, this devil knows Jesus, right? All right, we know another devil that knew Jesus or a saved believer, right? All right, go to the book of Acts. Book of Acts, chapter 8, 19, 19. Here's another case of the devil said, I know who Jesus is. I know who the person is. Acts chapter 19 and then verse 15. Acts chapter 19, verse 15. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, verse 16, and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Now, isn't it strange right here? Here's another story of a, demon, a demonic spirit who knows Jesus. But isn't it interesting Jesus or Paul or no say believer cast out that devil from that individual? Did you read that story? That person wasn't freed from the devil. Did you see that? Wow. Why? Why would Paul leave that alone? Who knows? Maybe later on he did. Or maybe he didn't get involved in that. But here's another interesting thing. You ready for this? Here's a devil that says, I know who you are. What have I to do with you? Our problem is we do leave those things alone. And we don't get involved when we should get involved. But listen, there are other demonic battles that you should have no involvement with. That you should leave alone. Think about it. What was more important here in this story? The Holy Spirit, who's the author here, he thought that the whole point of the story was not that the man was freed from the devil, but that the whole city believed God and threw away their witchcraft. Why? Because, here's the thing, if you're not careful, you can get involved and try to rescue every soul out there, every demonic activity out there, but there are just some cases you need to leave alone because the devil doesn't want you to get involved in probably another person or another bigger group of people who can get victory in their lives, who can be free from the devil's grasp. Paul was able to help out a whole city right here by ignoring this one case. Now, you know what our problem is? Listen, your problem is you get involved in so many little cases, you, you miss out the bigger picture. Well, pastor, why don't you help out every poor, uh, poor person on the street out there? No, because I got people in the church who are hurting, who need the money more than the person who's going to go out and buy drugs again. Right. Now, I'm not saying every person is like that, but I've seen that happen in my case before. When I offered them, hey, there's a shelter right there, shower, go down over there, they don't even go there. 
There are people in this church even, listen, there are even people in this church that the devil's gotten a hold of that you need to leave alone. Why? Because there are plenty of other brothers and sisters who are hurting and you're ignoring just because of that one single case. How many times have I seen it in my life where myself or other people get involved in single cases that you should leave alone and then there were plenty of other brothers and sisters in Christ or souls who needed saving, who needed healing, but you've ignored them. And I've ignored them because of single cases. You need to get your eyes open and realize that when you pick fights and go through spiritual warfare, you have to pick your fights well. Yeah. Don't think that you can get involved in every battle and save the whole world. No, you cannot do that. Let me tell you something this. Let me tell you another thing that's eye-opening. Do you think that, well, pastor, I have to take care of that case. That person is suffering demonic oppression, demonic possession. I cannot leave that person alone. But didn't you know you're still listening to the devil when he says, leave it alone? You might say, why? Because there are probably a dozen more out there that you need to get involved with, but you left alone because of a single case. Wow. That was a hopeless case. That was a demonic case. And God says, no, I need to take care of that. You need to get your hands off of it. There's a dozen more cases you need help in. There are plenty of people who need encouragement, plenty of people who need prayers, plenty of people who are hurting. But what are you doing? What are you doing? You got to get involved in that. You got to get involved in cases of people who are hurting and dying and souls going to hell. There are some cases that you have to leave alone. Let's look at, uh, go back. Let's go back to Luke 4. Let's go back to Luke 4. Let's go back to Luke chapter 4. There are some cases that you just need to leave alone and let the Lord handle. And you can't do anything but just pray for them. And there are plenty, trust me, there are plenty of other cases you left alone that you need to do. And you can't waste all your life and time on a single case that the Lord's hand is not going to be on. There are plenty of cases you left alone that you need to take care of. Don't you think so? It's about high time you opened your eyes. And realize that you've listened to the devil long enough when he said, leave it alone. Leave it alone. Why don't you pay attention to this single case right here? This hopeless case right here. This thing that nobody cares except you. Why don't you take care of that one? See, the devil can blind you real fast if you're not careful. Look at Luke chapter 4. And then we'll look at verse uh, 35. The Bible says, and Jesus rebuked him saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And the, when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and heard him not. It could have been simpler when Jesus said, Come out of him, that the devil just comes out of him. But isn't it strange that the verses, the devil didn't hurt him, but the devil just had to throw him in the middle of the room, right? But he didn't hurt him, you know? <laughs> Why would the devil... Do something like that. I mean, the devil can't hurt the man if he's being cast out, but the devil just wants to be thrown in the middle of the room. Why? Why? If he can't hurt him, why would the devil want to do that? Because it's interesting, when you read demon possession cases, or people who claimed it, or even the Bible itself, demonic spirits has a lot of force in them. Whether they, Their very presence and atmosphere has a lot of force in it. So think about it. This person has been possessed, so possessed by the devil. The devil has gotten such a stronghold on him that when the devil comes out of him, it's not going to come out of him easily. It's going to take a lot of force, a lot of pressure for that devil to come out that the body can't handle it that's just thrust in the middle of the room. That's how much of a stronghold and a possession the devil got upon that poor individual. You know what the thing is this, is that when you're in the business of spiritual warfare against Satan and his wicked one, and then you're trying to heal bruised souls, remember this, even though you can get victory, 
The devil's going to come out and you can conquer things in the name of Jesus Christ and by the blood of his son. And then Jesus came to set those captives free. Remember this, it's not going to come out that easy, buddy. It's going to have a lot of pressure. Why? Because the devil had a strong hold on that person, on your sin, on those holes in your life, on things in your home, things in your place, your work, your school, your relationships. The devil has gotten a strong hold on that one, that when that devil comes out, remember this, it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure that's going to come out of that. Well, I, I would conquer the sin better. I would help out the people better if there wasn't that much pressure. You're in la-la land. You know why? The devil had a stronghold for years on that person or the thing that you're going through. And because it's such a stronghold, when it comes out, buddy, that thing or that person or the instance in your life can't take it. It's going to shake. It's going to be under pressure. It's going to fall apart. You're going to lose stuff. Precious things might, might be lost. Things are going to shake up really bad. You're going to wonder, where did that come from? But remember this, there's a lot of force and pressure that comes out when that devil gets out of your life. When the devil gets out of that person's life that you're trying to rescue. You think that I can plan a church here without any pressure? Without any demonic attack? You ever wondered, why do demonic attacks happen to me when I'm serving God? You know why? You're getting the devils out. And who says there's no shaking up, no pressure after that when they come out? Do you know how much of a stronghold the devil had in this city for years? And you think that anybody wants to pastor a church over here? You think I got a hundred people like that at the first day? As some of these people, it wasn't like that. It took a lot of shakeup. Yeah, took a lot of pressure. Demonic attack after relentless. Demonic attack, demonic attack. You know why? Brethren, because you're kicking out devils. Amen. And it's going to take a lot of pressure and force. Let's go back here at verse 36. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this, for with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. Man, these people were like amazed by the power of God. They're saying, Wow, look at what he was able to do. By his word, by the words of Jesus Christ, it has authority, it has power. He was able to cast out the devil, he was able to free that person. What a wonderful thing. What an admirable thing. When you and I see a miracle of God, we would respond the same way. Wow, what a word is this. What an amazing thing. How many testimonies have we given about? Thank God for doing this. Thank God for doing that. Amen. How many miracles have we seen in our lives? Go to Matthew, uh, go to Luke 11. Luke 11. Luke 11. But can I tell you also this? A lot of times when you're praising the Lord for seeing a big miracle in your life, you have to check yourself on the area that you're doing wrong. And you might say, how so? Well, these people, you know, they were rejoicing, praising. Wow, what a miracle, what a great thing. As a matter of fact, they kept thriving to Jesus. They kept coming to Jesus. But can you imagine... Where were those, what were those people doing then? They let that man rot with the demon-possessed spirit. Yeah. Jesus had to do all the work, friend. Jesus Christ, it was his ministry that brought light to the darkness. Where were these, what were these people doing, huh? It's good preaching, brother, come on. And then finally God sends someone in their life that frees a demonic attack and they all, all of a sudden go, wow, praise the Lord, what a miracle is this? No, where were they, buddy? What were they doing? Wonderful thing when people compliment us in street preaching, but a lot of times you look at them and say, where were you? Yeah, wow. Wonderful thing, people come to this church and they compliment, man, that's great preaching, teaching. Finally, a church that don't compromise. Where were you? 
Great that people online said, finally, someone who speaks out the truth, stands for the King James Bible, uh, does something for the Lord. Hey, where were you online? Where were you? I'm so used to seeing the camera here. So I was like, where's that camera? Where were you? I was like, well. Where were you all that time? It has to be Gene Kim, huh? You know why I got in? Where were you? Why did I pastor a church here? Where were you? What a great thing. Praise the Lord, man. A Bible believer in the Bay Area. A Bible believer who's standing for the truth. Bible believer and all that. Hey, man, it's not about Gene Kim. It's about Jesus Christ. I like, I'm, I like to hear your names being called out. That the Lord would compliment, that did accomplish something for the Lord. Not Gene Kim, not Gene Kim. Where are you? You know why? We have a Calvinist mentality that when the devil says leave it alone, God will handle everything. God will raise up somebody. It's Gene Kim. The Lord raised him up as a champion in the Laodicean age and he'll do everything. Where were you? You listen too much to that whisper of the devil. You know why we have a Calvinist mentality? Because we feel like that we can't do the job ourselves. We feel like, well, I don't know what to do. A lot of, a lot of us probably don't even know, have never thought about that. There is one verse that I want to help you with, all right? Go to Luke 11. It's a famous passage everyone should know. Do you want to get something done for God, do you? All right, then this is what you need to do. Luke eleven nine, 9. And I say unto you, what? Ask and it shall be given you. When's the last time you prayed for that? No, you haven't prayed for those souls in those mission fields. Prayed for missionaries to go there. Prayed for God, help me be a missionary. Have me do something about it. No, you never prayed for that. Good. Always kept praying that, I pray that my loved one will get saved. You haven't pr uh, prayed that God will use you for that one. You know what? You can get something done if you pray to God for it. Well, I don't know what to do. Pray! Lord, show me what I can do to put a dent in the devil's system to help brew souls and lives. Have you prayed? Second thing right here is, notice, seek and ye shall find. When's the last time you researched? When's the last time you were searching and looking and saying, what can I do to help out? Too many people very dependent on God or the pastor or some kind of sign that the Lord shows that for them to do something. That's why we're all, people are dying and going to hell and Christians are falling apart. You know that? Because the world's so busy searching for something to do to minister people's needs that the Christians, they're just sitting on their duff on their blessed assurance and not looking. Why not sign up for campaigns for Christ? What's holding you back? Come on. Why not... Uh, Look, uh, participate in the soul winning events. What's holding you back? That's right. Why not come to the fellowship help out? Why not sign up on some of the volunteer sheet? Why not do something? That's right. Why not look around yourself and then see what you can do for the Lord? Amen. Doesn't have to be a church thing. It's even your own life. Amen. Have you even done something like that? You need to search for something out there to do for the Lord. But no, you're fine with what? My Bible reading, my prayer, and coming to church. Some dent you're putting in the devil's system. You need to search for something out there to do. You know why we keep having new things? Because it takes somebody with a vision who keeps thinking, seeking after what can I do to minister to needs out there that will be effective, that will work. Look at the next part. It says, knock and it shall be opened unto you. You can't just search methods or things to do where you can help out bruise lives, you got to actually do it. You got to actually do it. You got to do the knocking. You got to open that door. That way that you can have an open door and do something. You know why there are no open doors in your life? You're not even opening it. You're not knocking it to be open. Maybe some of you are doing that. And you're saying, well, pastor, I tried knocking and every time I knocked, the door was closed to me. It seemed like I made it worse. Every time I try to witness to my loved one or try to show them right doctrine, I just chase them away. Hey, that verse says don't 
knock after closed doors. Knock after what? Open. Open doors. You know what your problem is? You're not opening the doors that should be open. And you're wasting time on doors that are closing even harder on you. All right, if that right doctrine that you tried to show to that loved one didn't work, try another way where you think they might open up to. Never thought of that, huh? Your testimony? Wow. Come on, that's good. How has that been ignored so many times? Wow. But no, uh, you don't want to do that, right? Because it takes a lot of effort on your part to clean up Come your on. life, to show grace and patience. Wow. Maybe that's your problem. Preach. What would be more of an open door? Maybe a trap? Maybe your kindness? What is it? Some spectacular testimony you are, huh? You have to look at things that will open the doors. And by the way, the Bible never said you're done. What, pastor, you read through the whole thing. Ask, seek, and knock. You're done. No. If you knock and it doesn't open and you try to find open doors and that's not good enough, you read it again. You have to do asking again, you have to seek again, and you have to knock again. You made that up, Pastor. No, I did not make it up. What's the context of the passage right here? Notice right here in verse 8. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his what? Importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. You know what was going on? That verse was saying that guy kept asking, kept seeking and kept knocking. And when he was getting rejections, he asked again, he sought again, he knocked again. Amen. You know how I get these kind of fruits? I'm not trying to boast you anything, but if there's any good that you've seen the Lord see me do, I want you to realize this. I don't get it because I get a lot of talent, guys. Only the people who probably knew me from the beginning of the ministry knew that. If they didn't see that, then they should go more behind. This is an example. I am evidence of a person who didn't ask or seek or knock once. Amen. He was kicked around. He had closed doors. He made tons of mistakes. I had to ask, seek, and knock over and over and over and over and over again. And guess what? I'm still doing that. I'm not done. You know what you're not doing? You, you're not doing it again. You're not asking, seeking, knocking again. Because as soon as you knock, oh, it don't work. I'm done. Wow. Hopeless case. I can't do it. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, and knock. When I pastored this church, I couldn't just ask, seek, and knock once. Do you realize that? I was this close to closing the door to not continue church. Do you understand that? I was this close. But I had something in me said, ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. You're not done. Keep going. And I said, God, God, give me a church. God, I can't do anything unless I put a dent right here. God, I'm not done. Lord, use me, use me, use me, use me. Lord, just please use me. And God finally gave it to me. Ask, seek, knock. Otherwise, 99% right here, I wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be here today. I don't know how many, how many probably would have died, went to hell. How many would be in those apostate, queasy churches? Can you picture your life that way? That's what I want to cover in the last part, is in Luke 4, verse 37. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. I am past the time. Let me close it right here. But I'm glad Jesus Christ, he did not stop there. He was not too famous to stop his ministry. Right. You know, Jesus Christ, he cast out the devil and his ministry spread throughout all the land and people are like, wow, the Lord's using him. What a ministry. Listen to this man. And Jesus goes, said, all right, I'm done. Oh, praise the Lord. No, he said, no, there are more devils out there I need to cast out. 
more people who are hurting. Thank God he wasn't too famous that he was content in it and he stopped. No, he was still in the saving business. Amen. Thank God that he cast out the legion. Thank God he saved Mary Magdalene's seven devils. I bet you they're happy. But you know what our problem is? We're real Bible believers. Everyone knows about this ministry. We got our blowout. We got the great preachers and we got good soul winners in. And then the problem is because we casted out so many devils, we're done. We're not. And we think that we're too famous now to help more. We're not done yet. Even if every seat is filled here to the brim, we're not done yet. Because there are plenty of souls out there who are dying, going to hell. Plenty of Christian saved souls who need ministry. You know, I thank God that he wasn't too famous to stop what he was doing. But you and I would. You and I would. Look, think about it, man. Picture this. Picture a soul who is out there in San Francisco, grew up in a home that had no inkling of Bible-believing truth, and if there was an inkling of Christianity, it was a horrible one. Grown up all of his or her life into that, constantly watched internet, TV, influenced by worldly peers, the whole city's culture and thinking has brainwashed that child ever since from birth. You realize that from birth? And exposed to this propaganda that he or she could be whatever gender or color of the rainbow. He or she can do whatever he or she wants to. And they provide sin and the world 24-7 for easy access. And here is that soul bruised and tarred by sin. And here is Satan kicking that soul around, just laughing, spitting at that poor soul, while that soul is so blinded, thinking that, I'm happy. Stockhold syndrome. A victim. Kicked and spitten by the demons of hell. And not a single Christian saved soul had any interest. That saved Christian soul, like the Levite and the priest, passed by. But then here is that world, like the Samaritan, constantly feeding the need of that soul. And that soul is still blind, going to hell. Never heard about a single Bible-believing truth ever. But thank God that what is the one out of a million chance somebody gave that person a track? One out of a million chance a person could tell them about the gospel? Amen. One out of a million chance they come across one of our videos? One of out of a million chance they pass by an invitation to this church. One out of a million chance that this church could ever be planted here, if not impossible. Think about that before you pass by a soul. If that don't move your heart, I like to say the, this last thing. Remember that soul was you. Don't you thank God? What is the one out of a million chance? Somebody or reached out, pulled you out. Thank God your life got saved. You saw the light. Your soul got saved from hell. You got the truth above all truths. Bible believing truth. Amen. You better thank God for that. Thank you, Lord. Maybe you could care less about a person who's living your life right now and who's blinded by darkness and who'll go to hell. At least think about yourself, huh? That you were that person. Every head bow and every eye shut.